and welcome to worship with us today. Can I, first of all, encourage you to take a Bible, join in with the songs, and also, if you can, join in with the coffee and chat afterwards from 12, and 12 until 12.30, and the login details for Zoom are on the Facebook page. Can I also thank all of those who have supported Emma and me as we have done our climb up Kilimanjaro. We're about halfway to the summit. Calves are sore, feet are sore, but we are now uh, heading towards the end. And thank you for all who've supported Tear Fund. And that's a wonderful organization and we are fully behind that as a church. Today, we have got Emily Smiley reading to us from Philippians chapter one. Peter Mann will be leading us in prayer. And then Alison, Gary, Adam and Daniel Hamilton are going to be saying the Lord's Prayer later on. So do join with us as we worship God together. Jesus said, don't let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In God's house, there are many dwelling places. Christ himself goes to prepare a place for us. Christ has promised to come again and take us to be with him. Jesus is the way, the truth and the life. So let us worship God, whom we know through Jesus our Lord. And we'll do that as we sing, praise him, you heavens, and come people of the risen King.
So we come to God as we worship and as we pray together. Let's pray. Holy and sovereign Lord, creator of all that is seen and unseen, God of the past, the present and the future, out of your freedom and love, you have shown yourself to us in the one who was born in Bethlehem, raised in Nazareth, known by ordinary men and women through acts of grace and words of power, who died in shame but was raised in glory. Saviour of the world, in you alone do we trust, believing that you are the way, the truth and the life. So we offer you our worship and our praise, sharing in the joy that comes through your Holy Spirit, who draws us into your abundant life and sets us free to live as your children. To you, Lord, be glory for ever and ever. Amen. Jesus said, no one comes to the Father but by me. So we need to think about how we haven't always kept our focus on Jesus and we haven't lived the way he has shown us. So with that in mind, let's confess our sins before him. Heavenly Father, often we confess that Jesus is the way, the truth and the life. But our actions and our words demonstrate otherwise. He is the way. But so many times we choose not to follow him. We carve out our own paths and we go in the way that just suits us. We say he is the truth, but so often we select the truth we want to follow. He is the life, but we would rather live our own way. Lord, forgive us and renew within us a greater love for Jesus, that following him would bring our greatest joy and knowing him would bring our greatest satisfaction. For your glory and in his name. Amen. Brothers and sisters, Jesus said, don't let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. For everyone who humbly trusts in Jesus, sins are forgiven, hope is restored. Accept God's grace today and trust in him. Amen. We're going to sing about that as we sing together, I'm going to trust in God, after which Emily will read Philippians chapter 1, beginning at verse 21.
reading is taken from Philippians chapter 1, verses 21 to 30. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I am to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labour for me. Yet what shall I choose? I do not know. I am torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far, but it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith, so that through my being with you again, your boasting in Christ Jesus will abound on account of me. Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then, whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in the one spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel, without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. This is a sign to them that they will be destroyed, but that you will be saved, and that by God. For it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him, since you are going through the same struggle you saw I had, and now hear that I still have. So by now, you have papered the hall and stairs, you've painted the shed, you have made enough banana bread to feed the 5,000. You've cleared out all the cupboards and you've tidied up your stamp collection. What now is there left to do? How are you going to keep yourself motivated over the next days and weeks that lie ahead in this lockdown? Well, maybe you could take up marathon running. A man in Cheltenham decided that he would run a marathon in his back garden. He measured his back garden, six metres long, and he worked out that for him to run a marathon, he would have to go back and forward in his back garden 7,000 times. That's what he did. It took him just over five hours. Or maybe you could be like Dylan Hadfield. Dylan was faced with a summer of no cricket, which was what he loved. So he decided to recreate a little bit of Lord's cricket ground in his back garden. He made the stumps, got the crease, built a pavilion, scoreboards, put advertising panels around and decorated the whole thing to be like a miniature Lord's. Maybe sport's not your thing. Then what about the man in Stoke who decided to hunt for treasure in his back garden? And as he did that, he discovered a 600 year old medieval silver coin. Now he's all excited because he can't wait to get in the front garden. What about you? What keeps you motivated? At a time when so many of us have been put on furlough, when work has stopped, when the normal routines have changed dramatically and school is no longer on, a lot of people are left wondering what matters in life? What are the things that give us meaning, purpose? What is worth getting up for in the morning? What drives you on? Well, for Paul, the answer to that was very, very simple. It was one word, Christ. Jesus was the goal towards which Paul was heading. And Jesus was the fuel that fired him up every day to keep going towards that goal. He puts it like this in verse 21. He says, for me... To live is Christ, and to die is gain. If I'm to go on living in the body, he says, then this will mean fruitful labour for me. But what a choice! If I go to be with Christ, then that's heaven, literally heaven. I go to be with the one that I have loved and served all my days. I go to enter the presence of the living God. I go to experience all the benefits of what Jesus did on the cross and what he achieved through the resurrection. 
faith will give way to sight. I will see my Saviour and I will be with him for all eternity. But if that doesn't happen immediately, then it means I stay here. And if I stay here, I keep on carrying out the calling that Jesus placed on my life. Either way, it's Jesus. And that's wonderful. Being with Jesus, well, that's the ultimate fulfillment of everything that I hoped and worked for. But being able to work for Jesus until that time and knowing that every day I'm doing what God has called me to do and what he has placed on my heart to do, then that is also an amazing opportunity. Either way, it is wonderful. If I'm to go on living in the body, he says, that's fruitful labour. Now, when you think about it, that's an incredible statement to make. Because Paul is saying those words from prison. He's in chains. He has a death sentence hanging over him. But despite all of that, Paul is driven by a passion that he has for the work that actually has put him in prison. And he can't wait to get back to that. In fact, he's so passionate about the work that God has called him to do that there is a part of him which is convinced that somehow he will be freed from prison and get back to that church in Philippi. So much to do. So many people to meet, to bless. So many times where he can still preach the gospel. So many churches that he can form and Christians that he can encourage and bless and teach. So much so that even though all the signs are pointing to Paul's death, Paul feels this urgency that he needs to get back to Philippi to help the Christians grow in their faith and to share in the joy that they have in Jesus Christ. And there's that word again, joy. Joy in serving God, joy that drives him on, joy that fills him with a longing to serve Jesus, know Jesus and make Jesus known. Joy, joy that fills his heart, joy that spurs him on. Do you have that joy? I had a wonderful experience this week. Two of the most influential theologians of the last 50 years advertised that they were having a webinar on Zoom. And it was free, couldn't miss it. So on Tuesday afternoon, I grabbed my laptop and my books and I settled down to watch these two men. And one is 79, the other is 74. And their whole purpose was to discuss faith in Jesus. Well, it was thrilling because they were just like two excited teenagers. They were frustrated with Zoom, they couldn't work the technology, but once they got started on the subject that filled their hearts, they just couldn't stop. It was like they were talking about Jesus for the very first time. And I've met several people like that across the years. I think of another couple that uh, were around when I was growing up. Two ladies, both again in their 70s, Emily Rowntree and Eva Wark, who were missionaries in Angola at a time when there was civil war going on. They were captured by UNITA guerrillas and they were 
exposed to the most horrific treatment. After they were released, they came back to Northern Ireland to recover. But they couldn't settle. They wanted to get back. They wanted to get back to Angola, to the churches, to the Christians, because there was so much to do, so many people to bless. A work that God had placed on their hearts, and they wanted to get back to it. I want to be like that. I want to have that passion in my life. And why? Because I've seen so many other people who are the opposite, who just don't have that passion. I think of a history teacher at school, and in the corner of the blackboard, he had the number of days written until he would retire. And every day he came in and he changed the number and reduced it by one. Now, I I didn't think my class was that bad, but obviously he just couldn't wait. What drives you on? Is it your career? Well, there's going to be a day when someone else will sit in your chair. Someone else will stand at your station. Is it your pension? There's going to be a day when you won't be around to pick it up. Is it your family? Is it your bank balance? Is it your golf handicap? What drives you on? That is a very simple question. And Paul answered it in one word. Christ. You see, from the moment that he had met Jesus on the Damascus road, Paul's life was utterly changed totally transformed. God met him in grace and love and forgiveness and Jesus called Paul to follow him and serve him. So very simply, Paul is able to say, what drives me on? It's Jesus. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. For me to live is fruitful labour a purpose-filled life, and to die is the fulfillment of everything I've hoped for. Christ gave him a passion to live for. Christ also gave him a unity with other brothers and sisters in Christ. Paul never thought of himself as a one-man band. And for Paul, the Christian life was always one that had to be shared in community. He tells the Philippians in verse 27 that whatever happens, they should conduct themselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. But then he spells out what he means by that. And this is what he says. They should stand firm in one spirit, striving together as one body for the faith of the gospel. One spirit, striving together as one body. The unity of the Christians in Philippi was proof that the love of Jesus had changed their lives. The unity of those Christians was evidence that the gospel had the power to change people's hearts, overcome differences, and bring about reconciliation. Their unity was evidence to a broken world that God was real and that his kingdom was coming. At the minute, there is very little that we are allowed to be united about. A cinema posted up in America that they were now showing an old classic with a new twist. No close encounters 
of any kind. So we walk along the street and we're dodging the people who are coming towards us. We go into Tesco's and we make sure there's two meters between us and the next person. And we can't meet in church. So what does it mean for us as Christians today to be a community that is standing firm in one spirit, striving together as one body for the sake of the gospel? Well, obviously, labels don't mean very much. Presbyterian, Methodist, Church of Ireland, all those labels have been set to the side. Buildings don't mean very much because they're shut. Even all of the organisations and activities that have taken up so much of our time as churches in the past aren't meeting anymore. So what are we left with? Well, we've discovered that what does matter and what has come to the fore is the importance of prayer. The importance of supporting one another in practical ways. The importance of being able to share God's word together in different ways and at different levels. We may not like the way that we have this stripped down version of church, but it has shown us what it means to be a group of people who are now very much dependent on the Holy Spirit, united in our love for Jesus, and united in our desire to witness for Jesus wherever we may be. I think Paul would have liked that. Our passion for Jesus drives us. The spirit of Jesus unites us. Finally, what Paul says is that the triumph of Jesus gives us a lasting hope. Paul was not naive. He wasn't a, a blind idealist or a naive optimist. Behind everything that Paul has said so far is the fact that every single day he was suffering, suffering in prison. And it also seems that the people in Philippi were suffering. We don't know whether it was persecution from the authorities or whether it was opposition from other groups, but it seems to have reached a level that Paul says was frightening. So he has to tell them in verse 29 that not only have they been called to believe in Jesus, but now also to suffer for him. And that's a struggle. It's a struggle. Dealing with opposition, dealing with suffering of any kind, tests our faith and it tests the confidence of what we believe in. But Paul tells the Philippines don't be frightened. Don't be afraid. Evil will never have the last word. Yes, you're suffering. So did Jesus. Yes, you're encountering opposition. So did Jesus. But just as Jesus endured the cross and looked to the resurrection that would come, so we are able to focus on the fact that no matter how dark the day is, no matter how difficult the journey may get, his power is greater and it is greater than any evil, any challenge, any difficulty, and he will triumph. Sometimes we look at the news and it seems as if evil in this world always has the upper hand, that it is far easier for evil to prosper than it is for the good to prosper. 
But God has shown in the resurrection that he will triumph. Without any doubt, he has shown that he will have the final say, that judgment will come on this world and all that is wrong and all that is evil will be destroyed and destroyed forever. And in that hope, Paul says, we have strength. Friday was the 75th anniversary of VE Day, victory in Europe. 75 years ago, that was a wonderful day of relief, of jubilation, of public rejoicing and happiness. From that moment on, there was no doubt that the Allies were going to win. Victory was certain. But the war wasn't over yet. It took another three months before the Japanese surrendered. And during that three month period, hundreds of thousands of Allied troops were still fighting. Many died, many suffered, many gave their lives. The struggle was severe, the opposition was intense, but the end was in sight and peace was on the horizon. For the Christian, that is our perspective. That is our hope. No matter how life difficult, uh, difficult life gets, no matter how much of a struggle we find ourselves in, no matter where that struggle comes from, God has the victory. And that day of peace and of joy and of freedom is coming. So let me ask you, what drives you on in your life? What motivates you? What fills your life with meaning and purpose every day? For Paul, there was only one word needed, Christ. From the moment that he met Christ on the Damascus Road, Paul's life changed. Christ gave him a passion that filled each day, filled each moment with purpose and meaning as he served him, as he worked for him, as he fulfilled the calling that God had placed on his heart and as he looked forward to the fulfillment of that calling. Following Jesus brought him into a unity with other people, a unity where others give him support and encouragement, but also a unity that proved what the gospel had the power to do, a unity that drew various people from various backgrounds into one body united in love for God. Following Jesus gave Paul hope. Hope that no matter what he faced or how difficult life became, God had the victory. God would triumph. What about you? Paul says, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. For you to live is what? And to die? Peter is going to lead us in our prayers and then the Hamilton family are going to lead us in the Lord's Prayer. Lord, you are the God of power and might. 
In Jesus, you promised to free our hearts from trouble and give us hope of eternal life in your presence. So we thank you for the peace which your promise gives us and which we so desperately need in these uncertain days. Lord Jesus, you are the way. So we pray for all those who feel lost today, people who feel that the patterns and routines that once gave them security are not there anymore, those who are living with high levels of anxiety and doubt, fearful of what may happen today and what might lie ahead tomorrow and in the days to come. Lord, may you lead all those who feel lost and give them the security of knowing your love and care. Lord Jesus, you are the truth. We live in times of fake news, and it is difficult for us to know who or what to trust. We find ourselves confused by so much of what we hear in newspapers and on the television, and the issues facing us seem so complicated and unfamiliar. Lord, give us a quiet assurance that comes from knowing that our lives are held by the one who is always true and faithful. And may we be able to point others to that confidence which we have in you. Lord Jesus, you are the life. In recent weeks we have been confronted with the frailty of our lives and the boundaries of our ability to deal with illness and disease. We have watched loved ones retreat into isolation to avoid harm. We have seen others suffer grief and the loss of friends and family. So it is with deep thankfulness that we know you as the Lord of life. You alone bring resurrection from death and hope from the grave. We pray for all those who are sick, isolated, fearful or sad, asking that your resurrection power would flow into their lives, bringing hope, healing and restoration. In the quietness, we pray for those who are on our mind today. Lord Jesus, lead us in your way. Guide us by your truth and fill us with your life as we pray in the words you gave us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. So what motivates you? What drives you on? We're going to think about that as we sing our last song, which is Be Thou My Vision. But as we do that, may the blessing of Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, fill your life today and forevermore. Amen.
keep you make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you Lord turn his face toward you and keep you peace Lord The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. second guessing we know that we are protected may the peace that surpasses all understanding be our message grace and favors in your nature in your essence may his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and the children and the children may his favor be upon you and a thousand generations Yeah. 